Do you um, have some questions? Yes, I do. You don't have any? That's the only one I got. I got some <laughs> stuff that just came in. Oh, I got some. I got lots. Okay, I got enough here to here. keep you busy we... for an hour. Okay, let's see here. Are you ready? Um, you ready? Should I say yes? <laughs> <laughs> Well, ready or not, here I come. Here I come. Okay. <laughs> Shoot. On Fox News, they indicated that for every one job created in the green energy and other green products, there would be 2.2 jobs lost in the industry. On another point, they interviewed Robini, who stated that the economy will be sliding south the rest of this year with unemployment reaching 12% at the end of the year. Next year, economy will be flatlined, zero growth. Well, you know, it's interesting. I came out uh, and I said, because of stimulus and the money they're pumping in, uh, we're going to emulate the 6.3 or 6.5% of the fourth quarter and minus GDP, okay? And then I said that uh, for the rest of the year we'll be a minus 4 to 6%, and next year we'll probably be about even because that's when – most of the stimulus bangs in. But in the meantime, unemployment is going to still continue to rise. And so by the end of the year, I expect 22%. Now, U6, if you use the old formula from 1980, is 19.2%. Uh, John Williams, who is a better economist than I am, and I'm very happy to say that, has it at 19.8%. So we'll say it's between 19 and 20 percent, and so I think 20 percent, 2 percent is easily doable this year. We could get up to 25, and next year uh, it'll continue to deteriorate probably towards 30. And next year the, it's election year, and uh, although it's by election, it's usually a lousy year in the stock market, incidentally. Um, I would think that they will do another stimulus package of $2 trillion this time. And if they don't, I'll be very surprised. In the meantime, you're going to have all this monetization of Treasury debt that they can't sell via the Fed. And so it all depends on when banks start lending money again, and they will. And I don't think it's far away. And once they start... They've got to take the money that they borrowed from the Fed and gave it back to the Fed again to get a no-loss interest rate increase. In other words, they're borrowing the money at 1% and they're getting 25 for it, okay? So they're making a percent and a half of doing nothing. And it's bolstering their balance sheets. They are going to be forced to use some of those funds, a great deal of those funds to put it into the economy over the next year and a half to keep it from sliding precipitously again. And that will cause monetization. So the timing on hyperinflation is difficult because we got to wait for them to take these sterilized funds, that's what they're called, those sterilized funds into the working market. In other words, lend the money. And so it's a very, very tough call. So it's coming, and you just got to stand by. Regular inflation right now is around 9%, and M3, which is not published anymore, is somewhere near 18%. I don't have the exact figure. I do know that M2, MZM is 17%. So I've got to be close. And that's up from two months ago at around 12%. So that's a big jump. And I noticed China, incidentally, uh, has increased um, their uh, issuance of money and credit, uh, which they call M2, I believe. Uh, I have the figures right here. It's about 25.3%. And they're kicking $585 billion stimulus into the economy, and they've already started. And uh, they have 30 million, 30 million unemployed already. 
Now, these are former workers, not just people who live on the farm. And that's not going to get any better. Uh, this is a short-term palliative for the Chinese. And um, uh, their exports are going to continue to decline. And uh, they have some serious banking problems as well. And so China can expect uh, some pretty severe inflation over the next year and a half. And it could get worse if they monetize, uh, which I don't know that they have as yet. And so that's that outlook, uh, which includes uh, growth and unemployment and a guesstimate on timing for further inflation. So uh, some of these calls to make in here are very hard. But in the meantime, uh, the physical offtake in gold continues. Uh, gold remains strong, uh, not as strong as we'd all like it. Uh, the same with silver. It's sort of back and forth every day. Uh, but that will change. Uh, we'll, we'll have a good, uh, good month in June. We might be a little lackadaisical in July and August, but I think it will roar in the fall. And we'll have our breakout over a 1,000. You know, Bob, when we talk about the inflation dropping a little bit, you know, I mean, it's amazing because prices haven't dropped. I mean, the only thing that you really see out there that had a decline is oil. And food prices well, you're right are about that, and, but that's what the 9% is. Mm-hmm. You know, the government's calling it something like 3 and a half or 3. You don't look at the core numbers because they don't mean anything. And I don't even pick them up uh, from foreign countries. It's the same old gobbledygook. I mean, when we see uh, stocks like J.P. Morgan Chase in a rigged market go from 15 to $33 a share, I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, they're bankrupt. They're being kept alive by money that's being made up out of thin air by the Fed. And, of course, the owner of Chase Manhattan uh, owned uh, part of the Fed Reserve. In fact, in this issue, I have some of those figures. Uh, figures are 20 years old, but at least they're figures. Uh, it's so hard to get anything because uh, of programs like this and my writing and the fact that I get such enormous coverage because I'm on 20 programs a week, um, the government is not giving out any information anymore. Uh, they They just... It's opaque. And there's, there's no transparency. And I don't want people like me telling what, to people what's going on. Although there are people in the radio business who are, have been contacting me to go on other national programs. And uh, that will happen because uh, I, I draw a very large audience. And uh, that's all they're interested, really. And uh, so they don't care what I say as long as they get the people to listen. And so I think we're going to get another breakthrough or break out uh, into that market. And um, that's, that's important because we want people to understand very simply how they're getting screwed. And they don't know. And they don't know anything about the Federal Reserve. In fact, most college graduates don't. Uh, even those who took e- economics in fact, I, uh, I had somebody uh, ask me in the program this morning, um, well, uh, what do you know about economics? And I said, well, I had three courses at college, and uh, I've been in finance and economics for 50 years. Is that good enough? I couldn't believe they asked the question. But um, anyway, it wasn't hostile. I, I, it was just that, the person wanted to know was I uh, knew at this. And, of course, I don't have the voice of a 73-year-old man. <laughs> so uh, they think I'm substantially younger. And uh, they're probably wondering, well, does this guy really have some experience? But anyway, what do we get there, Melody? According to New York Times, China's role as the world's fastest growing buyer of U.S. Treasuries and other foreign bonds the Chinese government actually sold bonds heavily in January and February before resuming purchases in March. 
And according to data released during the weekend by China's central bank, in essence, China is slowing the purchases of U.S. and other bonds. And that's true. And Japan did the same thing about four years ago. Uh, they had them up to their eyeballs and they said, that's it. And so they haven't been a purchaser either. And if you look at the statistics, you'll see most of the buying is coming out of the Middle East and uh, in offshore places. And uh, the offshore places are places like the Cayman Islands. And uh, that's where the transnationals and the hedge funds are. And so they do a lot of buying in treasuries to accommodate the U.S. government. Um, 